Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. And with us tonight is Daryl Oster, who is the founder, CEO, and CHB of ET3 Global Alliance Incorporated and various subsidiaries. He has a diverse background in agriculture, real estate development, construction, engineering and design, and investment banking. He has served on various boards, was appointed to a five-county regional planning council, and was elected to city council. He was also voted top technology thinker of 2013 by the Denver Post. He's internationally recognized as a speaker, the author of several peer-reviewed papers, and the co-author of A New Industrial Era Coming, Initial Dialogue on Evacuated Tube Transport. Daryl, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's great to be here. So I thought we would start out by just getting some context on what evacuated tube transport technology is and why we should be interested in it. Evacuated tube transport technology, or ET3 for short, it is a new form of transportation. Our vision is once the system is built, is being able to travel from here in, in Colorado to say the Taj Mahal in India in about three hours for about 50 bucks. That's pretty remarkable. So walk us through what makes that possible. I mean, how can you achieve those speeds? What makes it safe? What's construction like? Paint a picture for us. ET3 is really simple. It's, it's essentially space travel on Earth. That's the easiest way to sum it up. What we're doing is we're taking car-sized, magnetically levitated vehicles, and they're, they're pressurized and, and have a life support system. They operate in a network of tubes that have almost all the air removed. Now these mag magnetically levitated vehicles are accelerated up to speed with a linear electric motor and then they merge into the tube with the other vehicles already moving through them like an automated freeway. It uses an interchange type of system. Once the vehicles merge into the tube, then they can be routed anywhere in the tube network just like packets of information are routed through the internet. When they arrive at the destination, they diverge from the path of travel like a car exiting a freeway, an automated freeway, and then about 90% of the energy used to accelerate the vehicle can be recovered when it slows back down using regenerative braking, kind of like stepping on the brakes in a Toyota Prius. Okay, so that last part, tell me why that's important. So you can recover 90% of the energy invested into getting up to speed at the other side when you're slowing down. So how is that different from a standard car and why is that important? Well, that's how Toyota Priuses and other hybrid cars um, that use regenerative braking, or, or electric cars like a Tesla or, or Leaf, um, when, when you step on the brakes, it uses the electromagnetic force to slow the vehicle down, and that electri electromagnetic force transfers the kinetic energy of the vehicle into a stored electric energy form. So it's uh, recovering some of the energy that was used to accelerate the vehicle. During the time that the vehicle is moving, it has to push the air out of the way and it also has to overcome rolling resistance. So that energy is not recoverable, just the acceleration energy. The acceleration energy is only a small amount of the energy to travel a great distance, but it's a large percentage of the energy used in um, stop and go traffic, for instance. So. That's why hybrid vehicles and, and uh, with regenerative braking are so much more efficient in stop and go city driving than they are out in freeway conditions. Just the opposite of uh, typical standard vehicles. So it strikes me that tube transportation, um, it requires tubes wherever you want to go. And so if there's not tubes going there, then somehow they have to get built. Can you, you step us through a little bit of the, the thinking on the advantages of tube transportation over, say, flying or creating some sort of a super-powered jet? Um, yes, the, the, uh, 
Um, as you hint, it, it, um, there are some disadvantages of evacuated tube transport, and one is that you have to build the infrastructure um, to every location along every route that you want to travel um, with that particular mode. Um, just like roads um, or, or freeways need to be driven on, are, are needed for, for cars to drive on, um, the same with ET3, it requires a, a fixed infrastructure. Um, airplanes require fixed infrastructure at both ends. Um, for the airplane to take off and land, you need an airport. But um, on, on the way, um, it, the, the, uh, the airways are um, non-fixed infrastructure. And uh, um, with, with ET3, um, we've got to uh, um, look at the cost of, of, of building the system and also balanced with the cost of continuing to operate the system. So that's what the same with any transportation system. You have initial capital costs and you have um, ongoing operating and maintenance costs. And um, there are relative advantages and disadvantages of, of all the different modes when they relate to those specific costs. Now, Airplanes, for instance, are a very high initial cost for the vehicle, but a very low cost for the, uh, the airways, the, the airways um, being the routes um, that, that are uh, maintained by air traffic control systems. So it's not zero cost. One would, might think it's zero cost, but it's not quite zero cost. So the, um, you've spent a lot of time thinking through getting the optimal size of the tube. And, um, and a lot, of, a lot of people's thinking is bigger is better, and that's not necessarily the case with, with creating the optimal size tube. Can you, you step us through that thinking on that one? Yes, Dr. Fry, that, that, yeah, that's really the most important thing we believe um, with evacuated tube transport is optimizing the size of the tube. Um, if, if we can um, agree that for a network to be interoperable and, and global in scope, the tubes need to be the same size so a vehicle can operate anywhere in the network and, and it can expand throughout the, the, the earth. Um, we have here in the United States, uh, 150 years ago, um, the, the uh, railroads were built to various gauges that were optimized for the particular route that that um, railroad was serving. It might have been a narrow gauge here in Colorado to carry ore out of the mines and, and to collect that and uh, to go around sharp curves and stuff in the mountains and, and minimal amount of cutting and minimal amount of tunneling or broad, broader gauges when it goes out across the plains at higher speeds. Um, then they realized that it would have been nice if everything would have been built to the same gauge, to the same standard, so that it could operate as a network and one vehicle could go anywhere in that uh, network of infrastructure. So what you're referring to, we believe is the most important thing within ET3 is to optimize the size of the tubes such that they're not too big or they're not too small. And, and that's the optimal vehicle size, we believe, has already been determined by market force, is the automobile. The automobile is one, the global transportation market. Um, it it uh, represents the best value. It's not too small and, and, and uh, it, it can achieve uh, utility. It's, it's a balance between cost and utility to achieve the maximum value. So with ET3, if the tubes are a little bit bigger, say a few inches larger diameter than optimal, ET3 would fail to achieve maximum market share on a long-term basis because it's a little too expensive. Um, it's a little too costly to build it, and it cannot um, be ex the network cannot be extended as as, as deep into the uh, um, the, the uh, locations that, that are served and, and needed for transportation. Um, but if it's a little bit smaller than optimal, um, let's say a few inches smaller, people are going to feel uncomfortable. They'll feel cramped and they won't want to ride in the vehicle. Um, you won't be able to move things that need to be transported on a frequent basis like items of furniture and big screen TVs and 
sheets of plywood for, for building and, and uh, stoves and refrigerators, the types of things that we throw in the back of our SUV or in the back of our pickup, or the types of things that, that uh, 500 years ago uh, a, a group of three or four guys could pick up and throw in the back of an ox cart. So transportation needs have really changed very little in human history and uh, moving human-sized loads and, and families, uh, family units, are really what the car is optimized to achieve. And the, the car um, has over 80% of automobiles sold in the world are five seats of capacity, plus or minus one seat. Um, so four, five, or six seat vehicles uh, are more than 80% of, uh, of the car market. So we believe that um, with ET3, the vehicle size is the most important thing to focus on. And then to make the tube as small as possible to fit that because the cost is very, very sensitive to the tube diameter. If we were to double the tube diameter, the cost would be at least four times greater because the atmospheric force tending to crush the tube dictates that the material wall has to be twice as thick. So there's a scaling problem. For, for the same, um, same safety factor. And, and indeed, it is a scaling um, problem. If we make the tubes big enough to accommodate buses or shipping containers, like some of the uh, other tube transportation modes that are being promoted recently, um, the cost would be at least 10 times greater and maybe 20 or 30 times greater than, uh, than with that, ET3. So that's the cost per mile to build the tube, or is it the cost per mile to operate it? That's the cost per mile to build it. To build it. Okay, so the building costs go up exponentially then. And then, so um, kind of step us through your thinking on somebody... The exponent's at least two and, and likely as high as three when you consider the cost of the tooling to make that and then amortizing the tooling cost out over much fewer miles of tube made. Um, it, it's somewhere in between an exponent of two and three. So I want I to, let's say I want to go to the Taj Mahal. Um, I go down to a local terminal somewhere and um, and get in one of these super fast cars and uh, um, have a couple other people in there with me and we just jump in and take off. Is, is that how it works? Or is, I'm sure it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, essentially that, that's, uh, that, that's it in a nutshell. Just like uh, you know, jumping into a, uh, um, a, a, a taxi or, or a limousine, um, we call it the maglev limo. Yeah. And uh, initially, those access portals will be fairly infrequent. Um, we think that um, it will be fairly quick once this starts to be implemented to reach the level of distribution of, say, Walmart stores. 90% um, of Americans are within 15 minutes of a Walmart store. So, Walmart could have in the back of their store where they now have kind of a warehouse area to uh, stock their shelves from and, and to receive uh, um, truck shipments that come in, they could elect to replace, say, one of those loading bays with an ET3 airlock where they could get products from uh, manufactured in, in China, for instance. Um, they could be delivered a pallet at a time minimum shipping quantity across the Bering Strait and uh, right to the Walmart store, that would save about 20% of the cost of anything is embodied transportation cost. So Walmart could turn their transportation then into a profit center instead of a 20% cost center for all of the items that they sell eventually. Yeah, so I, I wanted to, to drill down into that point just a little bit, the economics of what's determining the optimal tube size and, and the, the optimal number of people transported at a time. So I, I totally buy your argument about cars having won the global market and market forces having determined that about five or six people is, is the size of a vehicle that you want. It's less clear to me that that's true for the shipping. So we do move things and on shipping containers, on you know, long-haul freight trucks, things like that. And, and as you're describing this picture, that's very compelling, 
but it seems like you might have different economics at work there. So why wouldn't there be a parallel set of tubes moving cargo back and forth? Well, the, um, yeah, that, that uh, is something that, that a lot of people uh, initially think because of the, um, the revolution in logistics that has taken place with containerization. Most of the productivity gains in cargo transportation in the last uh, 50 to 75 years ha have taken place because of the sea land container and um, the multi-mode ability of that without unloading and loading multiple times, the cargo can go from origin to destination without a lot of labor cost. And that's where most of the productivity gains have, have, have taken place. So we're programmed to think of cargo as, as being large items. But when we really stop to think about it one step further, almost everything that is in those shipping containers ultimately gets carried home in cars, pickups, and SUVs when people buy the products at Walmart or Home Depot or wherever they, they happen to buy it um, or, or the, the, the food items. So if we look at this also from a cargo perspective, which roughly half of the um, roughly $10 trillion that's spent on transportation in the United States in a year, uh, about half of that is, is spent for um, passenger travel and about half of that is spent for movement of goods and cargo. So both are really equally important as far as the vehicle sizing goes. And happily, the sizing is um, very, very close to optimal for both cargo and um, passengers. If we look at, for instance, in modern warehousing logistics systems, we see pallet racking systems all over. And we see that the, the typical minimum shipping unit is not really the shipping container, it's a pallet of goods. And that pallet of goods, most racking systems um, ha have a, uh, a, a pallet size, the Euro pallet, for instance, is eight tenths of a meter by 1.2 meters by one meter high. And an ET3 capsule can accommodate three of those Euro pallets. Uh, most pallet racking systems are designed for one meter pallet heights. And um, ET3 can accommodate those. ET3 can accommodate stoves and refrigerators and, and uh, um, sofas and, and furniture. Um, that's typically broken down and not fully assembled. Um, when, when it's uh, when it's shipped, and uh, IKEA has done a lot of studies on on uh, reducing the shipping costs. Um, a, a lot of uh, um, cargo. Um, so so if if we look at from a cargo standpoint, an ET3 capsule that is 1.3 meter diameter um, cylinder that is 4.95 meters long, about 16 and a quarter feet long and about 53 inches in diameter can accommodate about, uh, excuse me, 52 inches in diameter, can, can accommodate about 94% uh, um, of cargo items that are shipped in um, container ships, for instance. Uh, a shipping container, standard 40-foot shipping container, can handle 98% of cargo items. So if if we were to increase the size of ET3 capsules big enough to accommodate a shipping container, the size of the tubes would have to be at least three times greater. And, and if we take three times squared, that's nine times more cost um, to accomplish only 94% to 98% um, increase in utility. So um, it, it, the, the value really it is um, sharply focused um, on a, a size of about 1.3 meters in diameter, so, so both much, for cargo so, and passengers. Yeah, so much of society is adapted to, I mean, we, we build appliances that can fit through doorways because that's the size of the door, um, or hallways and that sort of thing. So we, we tend to adjust things to fit what we have to work with. Um, now, ET3 being being round, 
uh, maybe we have a whole new era of round appliances, round, <laughs> round <laughs> furniture and the stuff. The Hobbit stove. <laughs> the Hobbit <laughs> stove, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we start coming up with some kind of crazy stuff then. Um, so the, the, there's, there's the, the distance between what we have today and getting to a whole new infrastructure on the planet. And um, I, I've, I've often thought of uh, a tube transportation network is ideal, building new infrastructure is ideal for a time when everybody's unemployed. And, um, and I know when unemployment starts ramping up, um, politicians get really nervous. And that's exactly the situation we're in right now. So it would, it would seem to me like this is like the perfect, the perfect storm for introducing some sort of a new infrastructure. But um, somehow you need the, the, the pilot projects to prove out viable first. Because it looks to me like as soon as a pilot project works and uh, uh, then every country in the world suddenly shows up and they want to be part of this network that's going to get built around the world and it suddenly becomes the largest infrastructure project on planet Earth. Um, taking, I don't know, 70, 100 years to build out to all the places that people want it to go. I mean, it's, it's like a highway system only, I mean, we're still not done with the highway system. We keep adding to it all the time. Only this would employ hundreds of millions of people, cost literally trillions of dollars, but it all pays for itself as it goes. Um, so it, do, do you see this as, as like the ideal time for something like this to get kicked off? I think the timing is really good for the reasons that you bring up and also the awareness of our fragility with respect to uh, um, infectious disease vectors. And um, if, if we look at uh, the, uh, um, the cities in the United States, for instance, that have had the worst death rates with the disease vectors, um, the common element uh, of that, and, and the, I think the most important factor, is the high reliance on public transportation and large vehicles. Um, just like air travel got shut down right away, everybody realizes that uh, when you fly an airplane for 8 or 10 or 12 hours across the ocean, that you're exposed to the 200 to 400 people on that aircraft and the, all the diseases that they might have that they're breathing in the air. So, so with ET3, the much smaller vehicle size and, and traveling more in family units that are already um, probably together, um, or the vehicles can be fully isolated in, in uh, groups of two, um, we can supply a lot of tools to deal with the uh, um, coronavirus uh, type of, of uh, pandemic uh, situation that we're faced with now and that has really shut down the economy of the world b because of the uh, uncertainty uh, of dealing with that. So if, if we can um, also find better ways at the same time to put these people back to work that w w with this failed economy um, situation, kind of the wrench in the monkey works, uh, um, so to speak, um, we also then have the opportunity to put a lot of those people back to work if, if their jobs might not come back as fast and also to improve the economy at the same time. Because if we really think about it, transportation is the master key to survival. If we can't get to food and water, then food and water has to be brought to us. So we are dependent on transportation whether we have to travel to the food and water or whether we rely on um, cargo shipments to, uh, to bring it to us if, if we live in big cities. So um, transportation, if, if we look through history, every time a transportation um, velocity increases and, and uh, we uh, have a far easier ability to survive. Uh, back when, you know, 20,000 years ago when it was just walking, um, we could affect a, a, uh, um, a radius of maybe a few miles. And then when um, people domesticated wolves to uh, um, pull dog sleds or domesticated horses or camels, um, the radius of travel increased, maybe doubled. 
So we might think that the standard of living might double, the ability to survive might double, but actually it's far greater than that because the area of that circle is proportional to the radius squared. So if we double the radius, we double the speed, we have four times more opportunity to, to survive. So with a world with ET3 could allow us to survive with a typical 20 hour work week instead of the 40 work hour work week that we have now. We, we could, uh, so we're, we're all co concerned about jobs, but I think the real concern is the ability to survive. And just like our great grandparents had to work 80 hours a week for basic survival, uh, the, the work week now, a typically 40 hour work week, with increased productivity and transportation, we, we could enjoy uh, two 10 hour work days and take the rest of the week off. Invert yeah. the weekend uh, week uh, relationship. Except for now, if you're unemployed, you don't have to work at all and you <laughs> survive. Yeah, just get your government uh, stimulus check, right? Yeah, that's all you need. <laughs> yeah, so this is a great jumping off point for talking a little bit about transportation economics. So I, I think most of us take for granted all that goes into getting goods and services from one place to another, and we don't particularly care as long as they're always there when we need them. So you just alluded to the possibility of it shape, shaking up the number of hours required to earn a living. Can we talk a little bit more about how tourism might change or dating might change or lots of other things might change when you've got this really cheap form of transportation that allows you to go anywhere in the world? Yeah, the, 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 the economy of the world can sustainably grow at a much, much faster rate than we've experienced in the past. Um, right now, we are kind of limited with how much of the world can enjoy the modern transportation of cars and, and aircraft that we enjoy now here, especially in developed countries, the United States and, and Europe and, and uh, um, Japan and increasingly China and increasingly India. But then there's the rest of the world like uh, um, Africa that, that uh, you know has almost no infrastructure um, built. So um, we're already starting to see that we are taxing the world's resources in our ability uh, to sustainably operate without poisoning ourselves with our existing modes of travel. What ET3 offers is the developing world to have a standard of living of the developed world with um, very, very little increase in, in the amount of resources required. In fact, actually a big decrease in the amount of resources required. And the countries that put this into place for the entire world can enjoy a standard of living that we can't even imagine. Just like our great grandparents could not imagine driving around in cars and, and uh, flying around the world in aircraft. The, the typical person now can live like kings could only imagine um, 200, 300 years ago. Yeah, back then nobody ever talked about the silly trillion dollars that's <laughs> floated around now. <laughs> yeah, just uh, another trillion. <laughs> yeah, just another trillion, yeah. Um, nobody even knew what that number was back then. <laughs> it's still um, hard to fathom what a trillion dollars is. Well, well, yeah. So It helps when you have the printing presses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what's the, the next step for you? What 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 are you um, what are you doing to make it make it all come to life? Well, um, that that is really where the rubber meets the road, and this is, as you alluded to earlier, a much bigger project than any one person can accomplish, or any one company can accomplish, or any one nation can accomplish. It, it, it's really a global vision and a global. Um, um, product and, and, and so, so uh, when, when somebody talks about a minimum viable product, is it, have you reduced it down to what? What do we need to get started? Yes, um, to demonstrate ET three, we believe that ET three to achieve the global vision um, must be implemented with the same standards in in, in every country. Right. And um, to do that, what we are focused on is building 
a minimum viable product to showcase all of the key technologies necessary to network ET3 at a moderate design speed of only 400 miles an hour. Okay. And um, that, that can achieve more local type of, of needs and uses and um, result in a uh, um, economic viability for m maybe a route only 100 miles long or so. If we only build a demonstration that's three miles long, it takes about a mile for the vehicle at 1G of acceleration to accelerate up to 400 miles an hour. And that's a new maglev speed record. And then the vehicle would coast for one mile, and then it takes about a mile to slow back down. During the time that the vehicle is coasting, um, it could go through two alternative paths within that single tube. It could do a barrel roll, or, um, a thrill ride, or it could just go straight on through for demonstrating it to public officials and, and so forth. But uh, Grandma would probably want to do the 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 uh, the, the, the the roll, right? Yeah, those grandmothers, yeah. Stra strapped <laughs> in with, with you know five point uh, harness and, and stuff. And, but but then it, it it could have economic viability. Um, operated as an amusement ride and that could be built for about 20 million dollars and uh, if it's built um, in a area between two major cities on a route that is highly proven to have a high travel demand then it could be extended out along that freeway or, or along that travel route to the existing right-of-way and uh, um, to connect um, two major cities together that say a hundred miles apart to 300 miles apart we believe that it, uh, the, the, the initial routes for ET3 will encounter the least resistance if they're built where it's a little bit too, tra too painful to travel by car, but not quite enough to tr justify traveling by air. That um, where the, the maximum um, market gap is between flying and driving is a distance of about 500 miles. Um, that's where you see about a 50-50 market share between driving the trip and um, flying the trip. Um, after that, the driving drops off uh, increasingly faster and the flying um, increases uh, um, at, a, at a higher rate. So, so this strikes me as um, kind of a modern day version of the pneumatic tube that they, they, they were using well over 100 years ago. Um, only this has um, engineered lots of the advances that they never thought of way back then. Um, so is, is, uh, were they the forerunner to an ET3 and they were sending tubes from the high-rise buildings across New York City? Yeah, certainly that was the, 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 the Victorian times. Uh, they used glass uh, pneumatic tubes um, to move uh, lightweight uh, uh, messages mostly, and uh, invoices and cash in, in uh, big uh, stores and, and, and things like that. I saw, and that, I saw. that's where they're still used in, in banks. Um, to scale those up, um, uh, um, a man named uh, Beach, who was the editor of Scientific American, um, attempted to do that under the streets of, of New York City and, and made a large human-sized uh, evacuated tube transport system. They also had them, or not evacuated tube transport system, but pneumatic transport system. And uh, they actually um, still use some um, to this day in, in a, a few cities for moving mail and stuff that uh, are about two feet in diameter. And there's also several places where they're used for moving garbage. There's a, a system in Russia that, that uh, has several kilometers of tubes. Um, there's some mining pneumatic systems, one in Florida and one in Japan, that, that are in use. Um, so so um, tube travel is, is not a you know, completely new or novel idea, uh, but, but um, moving the capsules with air pressure differential is very costly because the aerodynamic resistance, the surface of the, the entire surface of the tube, is causing uh, air friction and, and drag. So you're actually increasing um, the aerodynamic resistance uh, on a uh, um, that has to be overcome by uh, yeah, pumping yeah. the air. For the people that think that tube, 
tube transportation is a radical idea that we actually transport more stuff with tubes than we do any other way. I mean, we have water lines, we have oil lines, we have gas lines and, um, and sewage lines. And so we're sending all kinds of stuff through tubes, so, so why not people? And uh, it occurs to me that, that that's just like a logical extension of what we're already doing. Exactly. And to use the existing manufacturing capacity that already exists. And uh, um, th that's to, to achieve a new paradigm. It's amazing that automobiles ever took place because to mass produce those took a lot of vertical integration. Henry Ford had to build, there was insufficient capacity to build enough steel to make enough steel. Um, he had to build a plant to um, take iron ore and uh, make iron out of it. And then he had to build a plant to make steel out of the iron. And then he had to make a plant to uh, make forgings and to make uh, um, sheet metal. And, and it, it's, it's amazing that it ever took place. He had to build a factory to make transmissions and engines and, and glass. And um, Firestone had already built a factory to make tires. But eventually Ford had to buy big plantations down in uh, um, South America to supply enough rubber. Um, so so it, it's yeah. amazing it ever took place. It, what would not take billions of dollars of investment has already been made in ET3. Billions of dollars have already been invested, but the companies that have made the investment just haven't realized it yet. So that's why we've organized ET3 as an open consortium model so that anybody can get involved to help create a new market for their existing investments that they've already made. Yeah, that, one of the interesting stories I heard about Henry Ford is one of the biggest problems he had with this assembly line is just getting people to work on time. And because we weren't a, a time-oriented society. And they didn't have cars to drive to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they did, 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 yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah we, we didn't have clocks in our homes. Um, and so at, at one point, uh, he had hired all these people to go around and wake people up. Wow. And he would hire people with pea shooters to shoot at windows to, to wake them up. <laughs> and, and they would, uh, door knockers and stuff, and they would go around the city waking up all the employees, make sure they got to work on time. And then, then he finally uh, bought alarm clocks for everybody and uh, he insisted that everybody, because the assembly line doesn't work unless everybody's there. And so that was, a, that was a big problem. And so that was how he solved that problem. With, uh, but it, it took a lot of ingenuity on his part because, and that, you know, realistically, it wasn't that long ago. It uh, wasn't. About 100 years ago, yeah. and, and they were trying to figure out all of these challenges. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm anxious to, to go on a tube ride. Um, I am too. Yeah, so we need to kick this in gear, okay? I, I'm looking forward to this. I've, I've been waiting long enough. Let's, let's do this. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the, the, this idea of, of, I mean, just Disney having a ride that you could go on in one of their plants, one of their theme parks, I think that would be just uh, brilliant on their part to tackle something like that. Um, or, or a Six Flags, or uh, just uh, the ultimate roller coaster ride. Uh, you go 150 miles straight, straight up and then back down again. <laughs> that would be quite the ride. That would be quite the ride. <laughs> so there's a, a couple of things I want to touch on from here. So before we started recording, you were telling me a little bit about the history of the idea. So apparently evacuated to technology was back some time. And then you've also alluded to the fact that a lot of the technology that exists, uh, that would be required currently exists. So it sounds sort of futuristic, but in fact it's sort of old. And I, I think many of the component parts are currently available, like the, the mag lev, the rail that you would need to levitate the train through the track. So, so could you touch on those two things? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, uh, um, the first one to uh, write down um, thoughts of uh, travel and evacuated tubes w was uh, R.L. Goddard, who, who uh, um, became famous for uh, um, making rockets. And uh, um, he, after he died, his wife found some papers that he had written up, and, and she uh, 
um, patented some of those ideas, and those are the first patents on, on travel in an evacuated environment. Um, like you say, the, uh, um, all of the technologies exist to do this now. A and magnetic levitation technologies, there are several proven uh, magnetic levitation technologies that have existed uh, um, for more than 100 years. Um, the, the, uh, um, the submarine also was uh, um, patented uh, more than 100 years ago and uh, the life support systems for submarines that uh, allow people to live in nuclear submarines for months at a time or allow people to live in orbit in an evacuated environment of space for months at a time. So a lot of these technologies that have been developed in other industries can be leveraged by ET3 to bring about a new paradigm shift in transportation that uh, um, offers a enormous potential for economic activity and economic gain for um, thousands of companies and millions of individuals who put it into, uh, in, into use and um, for billions of users to enjoy a much better standard of living than, than we can now with our modes that are reaching the limits of their um, the, the, their expansion and, and their improvement. Um, the, the, uh, um, the cars and uh, aircraft really became viable, even though they were invented years before, um, they only became viable when trains started to reach the limits of, of their network expansion, where the um, expanding the rail network to um, areas with challenging topography and only a few um, you know, a few people in population. The economics that makes um, the, sense. The economics that makes sense to extend those networks out. We're reaching the same point with roads now, where the the we're reaching marginal returns for the um, investments, and we're starting to see that where most states and most governments are running out of money just maintaining the existing roads and really don't have enough capital to build new roads. So, yeah. so the average the average speed on Manhattan before the coronavirus was four, four miles an hour. Oh my goodness. Um, I imagine it spiked recently. Yeah, yeah it probably was the same in 1830. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, uh, it kind of reached a point where there, there was an optimal speed sometime maybe I don't know, 30, 40 years ago in New York City, but <laughs> it's gone downhill since then. Um, so it, it strikes me that that's the case in every major city. I, I go to major cities all over the world, and whether it's going to Istanbul or Seoul, Korea or uh, Moscow or wherever, it's just traffic jam after traffic jam after traffic jam. And um, there are several other things about cities that really are not sustainable. And um, er yet urbanization continues to take place and it's mostly because of the political influence of cities that exert their political footprint far beyond the walls of the city. But the cities are far, depend far more dependent on their surroundings than the surroundings are dependent on the cities. So um, cities have a lot to learn as far as sustainability goes. And, and, and just like uh, in um, hundreds of medieval sieges, if you surround a city and cut off its transportation and the flow going in and out of the city, the, the, the city is not sustainable. It, it will uh, quickly reach the point where um, the, the value of bread is equal to the same weight and value of gold. So we, ha we had to or, reach or more. We had to reach a breaking point before something radical changes. Are we, Unfortunately. At, are we at that breaking point? Is that what this is, is a breaking point? Um, because the, too many things just don't work anymore. And so is, is this a jumping off point where we've got to try something new? Um, do, do we have the political will to try something else? Um, uh, I, I, there's lots of different ways of thinking about this, but 
it, uh, this is a giant demarcation point where we've just, all of society just suddenly stopped. We're spending some time thinking about it and then we're going to start again. But it's not going to be the same thing that we're starting. Um, my, my mentor, Frank Davidson, um, realized the same thing. It, it took him um, 35 years of his life to build a tunnel across the English Channel. And um, he, he said, as, as difficult as the technology challenges were, that only represented 10% um, or so of the challenge of getting that tunnel built. The, the rest of the challenges were, how, how, do we, how do we finance it? How do we develop the political will, you know, the diplomacy necessary to get two countries that have been mistrustful of each other for over a thousand years to agree to, uh, you know, put a major thoroughfare between their... Uh, well, well, they don't even borders. drive on the same side of the street. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're two countries, they can't even agree on that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that. What, what do you see as the major political, financial, and cultural hurdles that remain to the realization of this idea? Well, with this COVID thing, we can we can all finally maybe realize that we share the same earth, and the political borders that are there are imaginary only; that they're not real boundaries. And if if we can start to think of things just a little bit differently, that that we're on one world, whether we like it or not, um, th then maybe we can start focusing on making better bridges instead of better walls, and um, making um, you, you know more trade in, instead of instead of less trade. It, it, it's so much cheaper to transport items even now, but with ET3, it'll be ten times cheaper. So instead of building a greenhouse to grow crops year-round in, in big cities, it's far more profitable to uh, um, transport between uh, um, areas that can grow um, crops year-round and uh, um, far less costly than building the greenhouse. So um, we really can have a much better world to live in in a much better economy and in much cleaner and greener environment if if we focus on what can be done instead of just maintaining the status quo and it's unfortunate that government really is the status quo but here in this country we are blessed that ultimately we are the government so it's with our votes and, and with our study and understanding that, that we can get involved in a project, and that's why we've organized ET3 as an open consortium, that anybody can get involved with, leverage the skills that they have, the production capacities that they have, the knowledge that they have, or even the contacts and friends that they have to help bring this into reality and be uh, compensated for it. So it's something you said that reminded me of Carl Sagan's book, Contact, if you read the book. Yeah, so it's much better than a movie in, in almost every way, but he talks about how they have these semi-permanent space settlements in low Earth orbit. So people live up there for you know, not, not six months or nine months, but for years at a time. And after a while, looking down on the Earth and not seeing colors for the different countries or any of the national boundaries, it changes the way they conceptualize the whole planet. It becomes harder and harder to imagine that these boundaries are anything other than imaginary, just marks on a map. <laughs> and that leads to them making different decisions and, of course, conceptualizing the future in a very different way. And, and it occurs to me that there's a sort of terrestrial version of that that you're describing. It's, <coughs> China's not so different if it's two hours away. If, if it's like, what would be the equivalent now? I mean, going to Kansas or Oklahoma, I mean, going to China and spending some time there would be relatively straightforward. And it doesn't seem like it's a, literally a world away when it's just a few hours away. And, and hopefully it can foster the same sense of interconnectedness. <coughs> Yeah, one of the things I talk a lot about is the um, that over half of all the, the babies born in the world today are born in six countries. And that's changing the dynamics of so many things on the planet right now. When So over half of all the babies are born in Angola, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Pakistan. 
the, no. the ones least equipped to deal with those babies. Yeah, that's um, they're they're the ones that still it's a culture of having wow. kids and and growing kids and but it's the people that create the economy, and most of the other countries in the world uh, are having declining populations. Uh, South Korea has got the, the lowest birth rate in the world. Um, you need 2.1 kids per family in order to maintain an even population. They're down around 0.6. Wow. So they're, they're dropping dramatically. And, and Japan is, is fighting them for the bottom. Uh, so there's a lot of countries that don't have many kids at all. And now, well, uh, after the coronavirus, we're going to have a whole big boom of babies coming at the end of the year. There's a lot of to do. A lot of, a lot of <laughs> Christmas, New Year's babies coming real soon. <laughs> but, it, it, um, but all of these kids growing up in Africa, are they have access to smartphones. And they, they, they know what else is happening in the world. They're, they're looking at it and they're saying, wow, there's so many fascinating things happening in the world, but they're not happening here. I want to go there. And... I have very little to risk by going there. And so we're becoming a much more fluid society and people are going to start moving. Country borders are going to become more and more meaningless over time here. Um, and, and, and so there's going to be a demand for new ways of going places and doing things. And, um, and so we're, we're, we seem to be at this crossroads of so many things coming together and uh, disappearing at the same time, <laughs> and, and it, it it strikes me that maybe this is the I don't know the perfect time to introduce something new, uh, new elements in the world to uh, kind of leverage all these changes that are happening around us. Um, anyway, I go off on a few tangents. <laughs> <a while>, <laughs> um, so our. Uh, Part, part of what you talk about, though, is the cost of transportation and how it plummets. And um, it, this, this type of, uh, well, driving and shipping goods on a train is still cheaper than shipping it on a truck. And so shipping it in a, people in a tube is going to be much cheaper than shipping people on a, uh, a 787 across the, the Atlantic or the Pacific. And um, and so it seems like that's the logical extension of where we're going with all this. Um, so again, with the, the the next steps idea, I mean, um, how do we how do we turn turn the key on this? How do we make it start? Well, yeah. So so actually, you you've got some kind of prototype proof of concept that you're currently constructing or that currently working. Well, why don't you tell us about that and then maybe theorize as to what a plausible next step would look like. Yeah, um, several prototypes that have, have been built. And uh, we, we lived in China um, for several months getting a, a project going there. Um, th those, those prototypes have, have not taken it to the level of optimization that make it uh, um, shovel ready for implementation. So shovel we, ready, like yeah. ready to break ground. Yeah, nice. So 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 we're we're really focused on um, taking what we've learned from those prototypes and, and tests that have been done, and and all of the uh, expertise in other fields, um, like the magnetic levitation and uh, superconductor elements and and uh, um, things like that, and to make something that is being already manufactured and, and to make the, uh, um, the not really a prototype now, but a demonstration project. And like I mentioned before, it'll take about three miles of tubes to build that. So we've taken and focused on the riskiest things first, which is to make a full-scale model of the uh, magnetic components, the, the maglev components, that mount to the vehicle and also mount to the track. And uh, we did that uh, a few years ago at the Da Vinci Institute. We, we took on that uh, riskiest portion first and it actually exceeded our expectations by about generating about 20 percent higher levitation force than we calculated that it should. So we also learned 
um, quite a bit uh, on, on how we can save even, even more money with that. And, and then the second phase of the demonstration project is, is what we're in the middle of now, and that is building a um, single section of tube and a uh, magnetically levitated ET3 capsule that operates inside of that tube. And it's only, you know, one section of tube being uh, 30, 32 feet long. Uh, the uh, 16 and a quarter foot long vehicle can only, you know, go a few feet in each direction. But that then will make it much less risky to scale that up and build 500 sections of that tube that, that then takes away the, the major risk. Um, the first investment being, um, you, you know, uh, um, uh, under ten thousand um, dollars. The second round um, being around two hundred thousand dollars, and and then the third phase, building those five hundred sections, um, take, taking about uh, twenty million dollars worth of investment, and then it can operate a, as a um, as a thrill ride, and if we only use it to ten percent of its capacity, it recovers its investment. Um, at, at about a 20% rate of return. If it's used to its full capacity, um, it recovers its investment in uh, um, only a few months of operation. So, um, the, the railroad world, there, you can get scale models of railroads. I mean, have you thought about building a scale model, uh, ET3 uh, scale model, like an HO version? of ET3 for demonstration. Oh yeah, we, we, we've been uh, built models and, and we lived in China for five months and, and they built a, a, a model that people can ride in. Yeah. And that operated at first in 2008. The, the um, Elon that Musk... That video. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Elon, the Elon Musk crowd that said that the Kitty Hawk moment in tube transportation took place in, what, 2013 or 20, 2013, I think, in, in Vegas, um, were five years late. Um, to make to make that claim, so, so um, that's already happened in China. We're, we're we think that there is a viable market for building toys that, that demonstrate the the capacities of ET3, but we're really far beyond that as far as it, uh, um, it you know in, influencing. Uh, I, I, I think the, the um, yeah the implementation. Um. You have some more questions here? Yeah, so I asked you earlier about how existing technologies could be used to make this a, a reality. And then I want to ask you what are the technological pieces that don't exist yet. But I realize that, that we haven't gotten a great overview of just kind of how the different components work and, and what exists. So we start with a tube, right? Is, is it made out of concrete? Is there some new material required? Um, concrete is a, 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 um, probably the best current material to make it out of, and uh, um, there have been some recent advancements in concrete that uh, about uh, 25 years ago, um, Boyk in France, about the same time that a company in, in, in a professor in Japan um, kind of invented it at about the same time, ultra high performance concrete that is about 10 times stronger than the ordinary concrete that uh, you see being turned into freeways and, and freeway bridges and stuff and, and buildings, um, which is normally 3,000 psi. This is roughly 30,000 psi compressive strength. And it's, it's also um, much less porous than ordinary concrete. It uses the same constituents as ordinary concrete, but it's micro-engineered to um, have all of the void, void space removed and take a lot less water to hydrolyze wow. and uh, much more fluid. And so ultimately the cost should be fairly um, close to ordinary concrete, but about 10 times the, uh, the strength. So then you put inside the tube, you put magnets, you put, um, you put um, ways of taking the air out, pumps, to, and, and then I'm assuming you have some sort of fail-safe systems along the way uh, in case something goes wrong um, 
So uh, kind of step us through uh, some of what, what would a mile of tube have in it, all the, yeah, the, the pieces. And I, I keep picturing this underground, but I guess it doesn't have to be, right? Well, that's, uh, that's just how it naturally manifested when I thought about it, but I guess it, doesn't, it could just be a tube running next to the freeway. For the real high speeds, ultimately, the, the uh, um, global backbone that, that, that can connect the entire world, if everything's built to the same standard in every country, eventually can be networked together across the Bering Strait. And um, that ultra high speed <coughs> system at 4,000 miles an hour would have to be underground, um, or most of it uh, underground. Um, to uh, control the alignment, control the uh, um, thermal coefficient of expansion and, and different, uh, you know, uh, um, thermal stresses on it and, and those types of things can be bet, best uh, um, met uh, with, with underground infrastructure. But that's at least three times the cost um, to go underground. Is that mostly digging or? Um, yeah, to, to make a tunnel, uh, there's a lot of unknowns in, in you know, what's underground. Um, we know very little of, of uh, the, the uh, depends on how deep you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the you know there's a recent story um, about uh, Elon Musk showed up out here in Colorado and wanted to build a tunnel between Boulder and Denver, and um, and the, the group that he was pitching it to is a transportation organization here that that couldn't figure out how the ownership worked below ground, uh, property ownership. How, how low does it go? Mm -hmm. uh, nobody knew, and so nobody felt they had the authorization to give him the green light to do it. <laughs> and so it stalled out be just because of the legal issues. Um, yeah, we, we, we think uh, above ground is, is more likely for the initial. And so if, if we were to take a, a kind of a broad overview um, of what's necessary um, to uh, build the uh, maglev train in China for instance uh, each um, foundation um, they had to drive anywhere from from 24 to 30 pilings down into the ground as deep as 80 meters um, deep to support the huge loads. And then on top of those pilings, they, they put a, a pillar, about 90 tons of concrete and steel, just to support um, a, about a 350 ton um, uh, bridge to connect uh, two um, piers that, that are 25 meters apart. Um, so what's that, about 80, 82 feet, and, and uh, taking uh, um, about uh, close to 500 tons of material if you include the foundations and everything. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure involved. And that's to support a hundred ton, a couple hundred ton uh, uh, maglev trains passing on that bridge span at the same time is the maximum load that it has to take. With ET3, the capsules only weigh 400 pounds empty, and they haul the same 800 pound, 900 pound payload is a typical car. So we, we only have 1,200 pounds of load maximum to support on, on a- uh, What about the tunnel? On, 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 a, on a given bridge span, that, that's the tube. So, so to support that load, the, the, the tube, just by virtue of it being thick enough to hold out the air, about a half inch of concrete with, with stiffening rings um, every meter or so, um, that same 25 meter span, 82 foot span, would only take about 13 tons of material. And the foundations to support it could be screwed into the ground like a helical pier in about 80% of the soil conditions that exist in, in the United States. Um, you, you can use a helical pier and that can be installed in about 15 minutes instead of weeks to pound all those pilings in, into the ground. So how high up so, is it so, off the ground? So, so then building it high enough off the ground so that existing roads can go under it, um, the, the, the standard um, for the United States is 13 foot six minimum bridge height um, to uh, um, allow trucks to, uh, to go under it. So probably around 15 feet um, high uh, un to, to the bottom of the, of the, so, of the tube. So it strikes me that when you're going at a really high speed that curves are bad. Curves are very bad at high speed, yeah. yes. 
so the elevations make a big difference. Um, curves right and left is one thing, but up and down is also another thing. So living in Colorado, as an example, going over the Rocky Mountains is going to be challenging. It's going to be hard to um, maintain 400 miles an hour when you're going up and down and up and down. Uh, so it'd be, would that be easier to go through the mountain then than to go over it? Yes, uh, we, we looked at I-70 between uh, um, Denver and uh, um, the ski areas. Um, we could uh, um, operate at about a 300 mile an hour design speed uh, along um, the I-70 corridor and ET3 tubes, the pair of tubes could go through the ventilation um, tunnel without disrupting the, uh, the Eisenhower uh, um, tunnel. So um, it, it would require crossing the right of way a few times and, and, and straightening out some curves and a couple of other tunnels, um, short, shorter, much shorter tunnels. But um, that, that could be uh, um, built at, at a much lower cost than it took to build the freeway um, through there and um, have the capacity to move um, at least five times more cars per hour, car sized vehicles per hour in each direction. So, um, so part, part of your thinking about connecting the entire world um, involves building bridges in places that there aren't bridges. Uh, like there's no, there's no really any good way to get from North America to South America, not, not on a car. Uh, there's this little section called the Darien Gap between Panama and Colombia, roughly 25 miles. A swamp. Uh, yeah, 40 kilometers, and it's, uh, it's a rainforest. It's really hard to, to get there. It could be bridged around through the, the, the ocean. But, and then you get to the, um, uh, up between Alaska and Russia, uh, the Bering Strait up there, um, you have uh, the Diomede Islands in the middle there, one's on the Russian side, one's on the American side, and that's about halfway across, so it's about 25 miles each side of that, but there's nothing getting to that point on, on the globe, so all of that would have to be built. So going from the, the U.S. to the Taj Mahal in India uh, involves going uh, kind of a long ways north before you can start going south down to that part of the world. But it's, at, but it's actually pretty close to the Great Circle Route. So, so that's kind of the route that the airlines take then mm -hmm. when they fly from one place to another. Um, and uh, okay, it's, it's just that there's no, um, no roads or no rail tracks or I mean just even for building the infrastructure out there there's no supply routes or cities or, or anything for the people that are constructing the towers. Or Light, lighter than air. Yeah, we'd have to. Um, airships. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean even helicoptering out mm -hmm. stuff to, to get to the workers out there. And that's so I'm just kind of working through in my head all of the uh, the they, they built the Alaska pipeline under you know across um, th those those uh, conditions, yeah. and uh, the work season is substantially less, so it, it it will it will be challenging, probably less challenging than building the Alaska pipeline. Now, all that heat in, in there tends to uh, um, thaw out the uh, the permafrost and the tundra, and you end up with a bunch of mush. So so. Uh, um, yeah, there's there's been over over throughout history. There's been lots of proposals to build bridges across the Bering Strait. And the tunnel underground is probably uh, better because then you don't have the uh, um, the force of the ice flows that are yeah. uh, that that can scrape um, you know plow five feet or so of, of sediment uh, two hundred feet wide. That, that yeah. Just, uh, yeah, but. Politically, everything's been agreed to, as I understand, for building something across the Bering Strait. It's just nobody's ponied up the money to do it. Um, and then um, it, it seems like kind of a, a lackluster effort. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. And then 
just nobody carries through with it. So we, we think it'll make a lot of sense to do that if ET3 is built in, in dozens of countries around the world to the same standard. Yeah. And, and, and then there's a lot more economic certainty in the cost advantages of, of putting in that, that uh, um, global backbone to uh, um, string it all together. And you have the network effects and, and, as they become connected, yeah. it makes sense for other people to be connected. And, and just like it, it, with the Transcontinental Railroad, you, you had railroads on the west coast, you had railroads on the east coast, but you had nothing in between because there was so much desolate ground and the investments required were, were so enormous that, that uh, nobody would take the risk until the, the government uh, started a contest and said put up uh, the, the, uh, the land grants and started a contest to grow together from the two sides to where they pounded the golden spike in, what was it, Utah? Promontory somewhere? Yeah, in Utah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a little, little time between now and then, I think before that, that happened. Yeah, so we, we think demonstration projects um, in, in, in uh, um, several countries that, that show a, a uh, positive return for the investors to operate as an amusement ride, a, a thrill ride, um, that can be extended um, for real world transportation to connect cities in that 200 mile to 500 mile range initially and that will help actually help the airlines substantially um, to uh, um, increase the uh, um, ease to get to the airports and uh, cut down on their unprofitable uh, short routes. Um, right. To, to you can connect focus two on. amusement parks. Yeah. You find two bush gardens that are 400 <laughs> or 500 miles apart. And right. set up. You get a day pass and then it takes you straight to the other one. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so it, there, there's undoubtedly there's a lot of people that want to find out more about what you're working on. Um, where would they go to find out more about that? Well, um, there's a huge amount of information on ET3 on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that have been posted on the ET3 Facebook page and there's the ET3.com website. Um, th there's uh, lots of improvements that we need to make to that website. And, and, and uh, there, there's, there's obviously going to be a lot of confusion with, with all the Hyperloop talk and, and people that are working on those type of projects. And, um, and so uh, explain in about two sentences how this is different than Hyperloop. Um, Hyperloop is like a maglev bus. ET3 is like a maglev limousine. And with Hyperloop, to um, pay for the infrastructure, the uh, user fare would be similar to a limousine fare, whereas with ET3, to use the maglev limo, the fare would be similar to a bus. Okay. So smaller and cheaper. Yeah. Smaller and cheaper, more comfortable, um, faster. Um, well, um, I'd like to... You couldn't carry elephants, though. If you have a pet elephant, <laughs> that's true. You're losing me out. Yeah, you're that's out. no good. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this podcast here um, and talking about ET3 and, and, and the vision, and um, I think it has massive potential. I think that uh, the world needs to take notice of this sooner than later, so I wish you the best on making that happen. So thanks for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you uh, doing some amazing things here in the near future. Thank you.